Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight um, and joining me. I'm Natalie Quadra. I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Engagement here at Marlboro, and I'm part of the class of 2009. And I'm so excited to introduce you, if you haven't already met, Alicia Metricardi. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. That's perfect, Natalie. Thank you. Um, class of 1996. And um, I will briefly introduce her and then she's going to take us through her journey um, from Marlboro to today and then we'll get into some questions and I think it's going to be really, really interesting. Thank you so much, Alicia, for being here today. My pleasure. Um, so Alicia is the general counsel for uh, and chief of development for New Economics for Women, at, uh, which is a national nonprofit economic development organization based in Los Angeles. And at New, she directs the real estate development team to perform all the affordable housing and economic development projects for both acquisition and rehabilitation um, and new construction deals. And she is this year's president of Southwestern University School of Law's Alumni Board of Directors. And she also sits on the board of directors for California Women's Law Center and serves as the general counsel to the Latina Golfers Association of Southern California. Um, so I can already tell like how you have, you have your hands in so many different things. It's so cool. Um, so Alicia, I'm going to share my screen and you can continue to kind of, you know, take us through your journey to how you got to where you are today. Thank you, Natalie. I'm so delighted to see you and see um, all of my alumni sistren on this call. Thank you all for taking a moment with me today. So I'm Alicia Matricardi, uh, class of 96, and uh, Marlboro shaped my life and continues to be a part of my story. So thanks for taking a moment. Um, and uh, the way we'll kind of flow this evening is I'll describe a little bit about my background and who these ladies are in front of you um, and, uh, and, and really kind of try to explain uh, and give context as to what makes me happy and um, what makes me proud of the career that I've formed and what are some of the lessons that I've learned along the way um, and anything I can impart uh, in terms of um, what my learnings are and what I want to do with the next chapter of my life. I'll try and pepper in and I really look forward to hearing any of your questions. So thank you. Um, so, so tonight you see in front of you, that's me, uh, Joanna Rosen Forrester, uh, Jackie Valmont and Renee Bailey. Those are, um, that's us at semi-formal in the 10th grade. And that's me in 11th grade on the left-hand side. Um, I spoke, Joanna visited with me three days ago. Jackie Valmont was a bridesmaid at my wedding. Renee Bailey just had her second baby. And among these girls and the other girls that I graduated with, I mean, th this is my Marlboro family. And how many years out am I, Natalie? <laughs> it's over 20, I'm embarrassed. I think it's like 26 years out. Um, and, I, and I continue to um, celebrate the experience I had and how I was shaped by the school. So um, I'll, I'll make reference um, to some of the things that I learned along the way in case that's helpful to any of you as you reflect on your experience um, out of Marlboro and, and grow your careers um, similarly. You can go ahead, Natalie. Uh, this is me on the left-hand side uh, at our color presentation senior year with Kimberly Baker Guillemet who is now a presiding LA Superior Court judge and mom to two current Marlboro students um, and Esther Na Schwartz. Um, and uh, Kimberly was uh, 12th grade class president. I was student body president. Um, and Esther, I believe was secretary. And this was us at our, our banner presentation um, for our color presentation on um, senior year. And that's Jackie Valmont and I on the right at graduation. I love seeing the, the graduation dresses and how, you know, the styles evolve over the years. Those were always my favorite things to look at in the library. Um, I'm in touch, uh, you know, I had mentioned Jackie Valmont before, but I'm in touch with uh, Kimberly and Esther all the time. So it, you know, it continues to bear relevance for me. Um, I started at Marlboro in the seventh grade and I, uh, one of my greatest, um, life moments. It's not embarrassing. It's just, uh, it's just funny that one, you know, I'm a mom of two. I have an incredible husband, a wonderful family, um, and career accolades. But one of my greatest moments was winning student body president. Oh my gosh. It's just unbelievable because, um, I had so many ideas for changing our, 
our, <laughs> our uniforms. Um, and I actually got a change through, uh, I was able to add khaki pants, ladies khaki <laughs> pants. So, um, you know, but it, it, it set the stage, uh, truly it set the stage for um, a service. Because uh, I continue to do that, I, I I think of myself as providing a service to clients today. I'm in service to the city of Los Angeles by my affordable housing work. Um, I'm in service to Southwestern Law School, my law school, as I volunteer and work with students. And I I want to be in service um, with you today, vis-a-vis -vis Marlboro. So um, it it laid a foundation. You know what I did in school mattered, um, and I continue to to try to live that out today. Go ahead, Natalie. So that's my background at Marlboro. Um, and I graduated from Marlboro, went to undergrad uh, in the Bay Area, UC Berkeley. Um, I built a career in the law, not knowing I would fall into the law, but thinking, you know, speech, I was in speech and debate at Marlboro. And um, I can tell you, those of us who participated in speech and debate tended to go into um, law careers. Um, I was also one of the founding members of OLE, the Organized Latina Exchange with Toby Adler and um, Elizabeth Bendania and Jackie Valmont. So um, that was also some, you know, an advocacy around um, issues relating to um, diverse student body was something very important to me. Um, so anyway, in undergrad, uh, I studied American studies. Um, I majored uh, developing, it's like a choose your own adventure major at UC Berkeley at the time for American studies with a little bit of law um, and urban studies. Um, and and uh, I minored in city and regional planning. Um, and from there, I got my first job as a project manager at a nonprofit that I work at now, New Economics for Women, um, and decided I wanted a seat at the table after uh, attending a board meeting of the California Women's Law Center that I really wanted um, to be a lawyer at that point in time. Um, I applied to law school and I got into Southwestern. So in the photo, you'll see that's Wilshire Boulevard and the flag, that's the Campanile um, at Bullock's Wilshire where Southwestern is headquartered. Um, and the flags are from um, a protest <laughs> that I participated in um, along Wilshire Boulevard for immigrant rights. So that must have been 2006. Um, and that was, um, you know, just uh, thousands of people on Wilshire Boulevard, um, a really historic day, um, looking at um, some of the issues that I was really interested in, continue to be um, around social justice and advocacy work. Good in advance now. Um, so what I do now is I'm, I'm a functioning lawyer. And so I specialize, you know, within the law, you, you tend to pick up what, what are the areas of specialty? I perform nonprofit law, I perform um, real estate law. Those are the two kind of general aspects of the law um, that I focus on. But my context is so different. My context is economic development and community development. So here are some definitions just to set the stage so you can understand kind of the jargon as we go through some of my career. Economic development are programs, policies, or activities that seek to improve the economic well-being and quality of life for a community. Whereas community development, in my opinion, is often so much more local. Um, it's real estate and public spaces um, intersecting for people and outcomes. And it empowers individuals and group of peoples with the skills they need to um, change their own neighborhoods. So economic development is often um, the, you know, a larger field, whereas community development focuses more on um, block by block or individual strategies and advocacy. How do we warm the room for all, uh, for, for all of the voices that need to be heard as we take seats at the table? I often use the phrase seats at the table because for me, it describes um, our position, our bargaining power, and, um, and how much our voice is heard when issues are negotiated or settled that affect our daily lives. And for me, getting a seat at the table as a lawyer was in the economic development context. So representing clients or representing community, um, 
for me, it's, it's very important that voices are heard and that we're warm to all of the voices that we can make the best and most educated decisions about how our landscape, our environment, our political processes, um, how justice is shaped. So a lot of lofty stuff, but I hope that um, I can kind of encapsulate these and we can discuss them tonight. And this is just context. These are the spaces that I work in as a lawyer on a daily basis. Go ahead, Natalie. And then this is some of the fun stuff that I get to do. Okay, so why do I have my hard hat in the background? I actually get to wear a hard hat quite often um, in my work for nonprofits, building economic development projects um, and, and working in the space for community economic development. So on the upper left, you'll see me with one of my colleagues and students. Um, this was in 2008, this was, uh, excuse me, 2018. Um, we built eight single family modular homes. So modular construction is factory or offsite built and then transported in and um, quadrants to be able to form residential or commercial spaces. And in this case, we built eight single family homes. So you'll see in the upper right hand, part of the screen, half a house, <laughs> you see me waving. And then I'm high-fiving one of the students that was there the day that we brought, this is, this is development jargon, the mods, the day that we brought the mods to this one street in um, Canoga Park, an area of the San Fernando Valley where New Economics for Women was um, building affordable home ownership. So as a lawyer, I spearheaded this project and it's an example of the work that I do. And why were there kids on site at a construction site, you might ask a lawyer. <laughs> um, New Economics for Women is a, it's a multifaceted nonprofit organization that has a sister spinoff um, that builds charter schools. And so this was, these were the kids from the charter elementary school right around the corner. And I mean, I stood on my head this day for the kids. Um, I was not only the senior real estate person on site, so working with the contractors that you see standing on some of the cranes, um, but then we had classrooms of kids that walked in and we did a whole STEM dynamic for them. You know, women in real estate, women of color in real estate, we really felt it was a huge opportunity to see women in construction boots and hard hats working alongside the um, other professional construction workers, um, really having a seat at the table. And so we thought it was not only a, a STEM opportunity, the angle of the cranes and the weight, how much each crane could bear and how you have to do, use counter levers, but we also um, are, and I'm, I'm particularly conscientious of being a, a model for the, the positive careers that um, anyone can pursue. And it was so lovely to have all of these kids, they're particularly low income in this community um, and really to expose them to these kinds of careers, it was really cool. So that's the top three photos. And then below, the, the one on um, the lower left describes the houses and kind of gives you a picture of what the houses ended up looking like. They were very beautiful. And this is just one project I worked on for the nonprofit. And then the lower two photos on the right, um, me in a hard hat uh, with one of my uh, project managers, Cheryl Bates on the lower right. And then a bunch of my colleagues in the center photo. This was us touring an affordable housing development that we helped to build in partnership with another incredible nonprofit in South LA. And um, it was actually, it's two developments and it's all affordable housing for low-income families, transition age youth. So that's kids who are transitioning out of foster care who have a really high incidence of homelessness and often need affordable housing as a stepping stone as they hit 18 and are just thrust upon the world without family resources to back them up. Um, and um, single individuals who are chronically homeless and families um, who have experienced homelessness as well. So that that's, I often describe kind of the user types when we're building housing or building economic development centers like commercial spaces, right? Stores 
or community centers, you got to know the user so that you can craft all the, the needs around what that user requires. And as a lawyer, I, well, I wear a lot of hats. <laughs> I work on the real estate side. I look at contracts. I look at financing. Um, and I get to wear a hard hat. And I get to live and breathe this dynamic field um, as we shape spaces for how people live and work and play. And um, I, I consider it my high honor. You can move forward, Natalie. So those are two examples of the work that I do. The other aspect of the work that I do has to do with fundraising. So I typically work for nonprofits that are high performing, um, that, that go out into the world and convince companies and other foundations that the work that they're doing is so valuable and really hits the bottom line that if you give a dollar to this nonprofit, you can create an opportunity in a more cost-effective way than you know, even like a public subsidy or government type subsidy. And so the, the photo on the left is me with two um, representatives of Glossier, the incredible skincare company that sponsored New Economics for Women um, with, with major grants. And that was me on behalf of the organization accepting um, their donation. And then the photo on the right with the three ladies um, with the strollers was um, from another event I put together. It was called the Moms Helping Moms 5K Run Walk. And I spearheaded the whole thing. So that was in a park in downtown LA, the um, California State Historic Park. It used to be called the Cornfields. And it was a 5K run that raised money for um, a development specific to formerly homeless and domestic violence victims in a housing facility um, owned and operated by New Economics for Women called La Posada. And so these were just moms who heard about the event and um, took their babies in strollers to the event. And we actually were the first nonprofit to do um, a, a competition around um, individuals, not necessarily moms, but parents pushing kids in strollers in a 5k. And so we set that up, um, to raise money year after year. And because of COVID, we've had to suspend that the past two years, but those are examples of the fun things that I get to work on also raising a fun development hat, right? So, uh, um, it, it's, it's really, it's about grant making, and making connections for nonprofit work um, that help to grow what a nonprofit can do. Um, and that type of philanthropic work is really important to me. You can go ahead now. That is all yeah. the photos, yeah. <laughs> so <clears throat> I wanted to ask you, um, how have you seen your work evolve over time since you got, since you started in this space after law school or maybe during yeah. law school, you know, to now, yeah. what have been the most significant changes in this industry? Well, you know, um, after law school, I, I was not working for the nonprofit. I was actually working for a, a number of law firms and I was doing, um, I work, I trained under trial lawyers. Um, I worked for O'Melveny and Myers for a period of time as um, kind of the lowest person on the totem pole, but, but training up for um, helping them with major trials. So I was able to kind of um, hone my skills as a lawyer, right? So the, that, that needed to happen so that I can tra could transition into um, working with private clients. I, I formed my own law firm, Matricardi Law, out of the experience of working for other law firms. And um, I, I eventually shed the fear that I had um, of my own success, right? I shed the fear of, um, you know, oh, I, I, I can't operate a law firm. Um, I'm too small. I can't operate a law firm. I won't, I won't know what to do. I started I, set, I really set like a 10 year plan to try to figure out what I wanted to do and how I could transition into um, being my own boss. And so I, I was able to form my own law firm and grow my client base while I was practicing on the side um, for some other large firms, making sure that I had a paycheck. 
And I, my transition was pretty gradual. I mean, I'm not a classic entrepreneur that decides, you know, um, as of today, <laughs> I'm going to, you know, take out a small business loan and make the jump. Um, I've been more measured than that because I've needed the consistency mm -hmm. um, as I have figured it all out. But I have gotten more, um, more confident in being able to say that the area that I love the most is community development and nonprofit law and real estate law. So I was one of um, the early, I think I was one of the smallest shops that, that represented a publicly traded um, company at one point. It was a sundry company that operates here in Los Angeles. And they brought me on and I know I was the smallest fry lawyer that they were working with. Um, but they saw in me that they could get someone who was pretty seasoned in real estate on the phone pretty quickly mm -hmm. and saw in me that I could handle the workload. It taught me that a part of coming to the table um, and really taking a seat and letting your voice be heard is that your professionalism and your ethics have to be right up front so that people know what, what makes you tick. And um, if you're not vouched for by a big company behind you, or in my case, a big law firm, um, I think one of the features that has helped me is making sure that the integrity and ethics are up front so that someone could, could kind of see my book of business and, and develop that, that level of trust in hiring me. And that was really important. And I think another lesson um, for me was to, to look beyond, so I'm, I'm Latina Italian and I'm a woman. And I think one of my greatest um, lessons has been to not just look at for other Latina Italian women. Um, some of my greatest mentors, you know, um, don't reflect any of those attributes, but they're brilliant. And they, they saw in me aspects of themselves, whether they were Korean or Armenian or male or gay. And it, it didn't need to, they didn't need to find that um, reflection in the mirror from the cultural or gender dynamics. The reflection they see in me are the attributes of, I think, listening, wanting to grow in a career, um, the excitement around the law, right? So, so I've learned to really, um, be open to looking for mentors that are kind of beyond um, what I might see in the mirror. And then the other aspect I think that has been really important to my career development um, is to be able to look in the mirror and see um, someone who could inspire me. <laughs> um, not having to look beyond yourself is this you know, it's a rite of passage, but it's something that we all, I think, have to, to learn to own that you can blaze a trail <laughs> and do something dynamic. Um, and as long as, you know, your, your heart is in it. And I, again, you lead with integrity and the attributes that you would want to surround yourself with, then I think you can confidently look in the mirror and sleep well at night and know that you're trying something new and different and it might be daunting, um, but it'll be so much more worth it. And so that has helped to, to guide my career as well. That's amazing. Thank you. For <laughs> <having fun. laughs> um, so in terms of what you're working on today, it was great to hear you kind of take us through your career path to today, but yeah. um, I think there's a lot happening right now, especially in Los Angeles that I'm sure you're, you have your hand in in some way or another, and you're helping support. So if you want to talk us through some of those projects, I would love to hear more about what you're doing. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I'll give, I'll give you a slice of some things I was working on today. Um, I had a big meeting at New Economics for Women today, preparing for a major real estate development application that will go out the door to build affordable housing in El Sereno, which is an area of Los Angeles, uh, you know, pretty working class area that has had um, uh, uh, this, um, how, how do I put it? Um, there are properties in El Sereno that have been deliberately neglected 
by the state of California's Department of Transportation. And if anybody wants to, to Google this, um, these Caltrans properties have been um, vacant for 30 years. So about two years ago, um, many, um, many groups, many advocacy groups, many neighborhood groups said, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. We've got moms out here living in their cars. And here's Caltrans sitting on properties that are boarded up and no one's allowed to live in them in these areas that you know kids are going to school and you know they're high value and so people started to occupy these houses and i think one of the things that i've had to um thread the needle in my career is balancing my strong desire for advocacy and social justice with the need to really understand um what are the regulations around that and how can we make sure that people are safe when they're breaking into houses to find places to live overnight. I mean, it brings up the context of our affordable housing crisis here in California and how it's it's literally spread to, to other states, right? The dearth of affordable housing um, and safe and decent housing for people to live in. And so today I spent my time working on a huge, it's called a pro forma, it's an Excel spreadsheet of the, the, the numbers, you know, what would it take from a construction, acquisition, rehabilitation, and new construction lens, hence the hard hat, to put together this development project. And it, it's so cool. So it involves me thinking as a lawyer, thinking as a mom, thinking as a taxpayer, thinking as a responsible individual, and thinking as a neighbor that what the heck are these houses doing here <laughs> abandoned, right? Um, and how can we repurpose them um, and make them livable spaces for our community again? So that's what I worked on. And then the other context this afternoon before this presentation, I was with some colleagues from Southwestern Law discussing something that we want to do. And um, part of my work through the board of uh, directors for the alumni association is to really encourage the students to engage in um, in discourse right in conversations where we have very strong opposing opinions and i can give two examples of, of me working on on this kind of discourse um, one of them is to put on a presentation perhaps in the spring on the COVID eviction moratorium that's underway. So LA city, LA County and the state all have separate regulations saying if you are um, uh, individuals or families renting in rent controlled properties and that's, that's properties that were put into the market or created prior to a, a certain year depending on the county and the state regulation. You're not allowed to evict someone unless it's for certain causes. So um, that eviction moratorium puts the onus of our affordable housing crisis and how as a, as a, as a region, we respond to COVID on property owners, right? So I see it in both ways. And our dialogue is going to be to encourage students, particularly these law students, um, how do you, how, how do you take an issue that just makes your blood boil and distill it into a way that you can make a coherent presentation and how do you literally sit across the table at a dinnertime conversation with someone who believes completely the opposite of your own belief and so we engage lawyers to have that kind of conversation and it gets really heated and students to participate as well so that we can model those behaviors um, so, so one that we're doing, this is called the Inn of St. Ives, and one of them will be, I hope, you know, this is in my planning stages, we'll, but one could be on the eviction moratorium. Um, the other aspect of that conversation is around homelessness, and my work in affordable housing has also taught me um, how important it is to stay engaged and really to have a good empathetic approach to some of these issues. I mean, um, there are individuals dying in the street. And at the same time, there are individual um, store owners or renters 
or homeowners that have other individuals living in a public space that perhaps are leaving behind um, aspects of that street life that make it hard for moms to let their kids play at a park or for somebody to take a walk or for somebody to wait at a bus stop to get to work on time. And how do we coalesce these competing needs? I mean, how do we prioritize them? How do we discuss them? How do we find solutions for them? Because like it or not, we're all in. And, and this is whether we are community developers or lawyers or it, it, just operating within Southern California, it's all of our responsibility to engage in that dialogue and find solutions. So that's another possible discourse um, that we can have uh, with the law students, but it is really something that I work on on a daily basis to try to frame up how can we have these conversations and where's the money and what are the solutions that we can do to think out of the box and, and really exhibit strong leadership to find um, some solutions. I mean, it, it touches on so many aspects of our humanity. And so it's really important to me. So those are, Natalie, some projects. <laughs> that's, that's what I touched on today. And it's really fun stuff. Yeah, uh, and really big issues. I mean, you mentioned before when we were going through the slides that you, what you love about being able to be on the ground, wearing the hard hat and engaging with the communities is that you also get to hear from them and what they want you know, being residents of and um, living that life every day, wherever it might be yeah. or however it might look. But I'm curious when you're approaching these issues, how, where do you start? Like, do you go and talk to people? Do you have teams that can go out and connect with the communities that you're trying to help? And, you know, you're looking at it from so many different perspectives, which I think is amazing and probably not very easy for a lot of people to have to you know, bring together all these different perspectives yeah. on the issue, but like, where do you start when it comes yeah. to something? You like know, that? and this is where I, I advise nonprofit clients or developer clients as well. Mm -hmm. um, this is where your values have to kind of be uh, upfront. And, and, you know, um, I think a part of community development is the transparency that you give to whomever you're having a conversation with. Nobody wants to have a conversation with someone who's being duplicitous. So the positions that you take, they need to have some kind of like rational connection to some, some trajectory, some, some, some set of values that you can align around. Um, for one of my clients, New Economics for Women is dynamic nonprofit. The, the set of values there is really to be invited into communities. And for that nonprofit, um, we listen to single parent moms and children as to what their community needs when we're trying to figure out a community development plan. That's a very unique, important perspective, right? But that's something that the organization prides itself on. And it's a very different way of doing business. So sometimes that innovation is helpful because people recognize, oh, that's that's different. You know, mm -hmm. want to hear from single parent mom. What does a single parent mom feel like pushing the stroller around the block? That's a different perspective. Um, for other clients, it's often for, it's particularly for developer clients, right? Um, how do you how do you connect with community to say, I want to tear something down and build something new. And I don't live here. I'm buying a parcel, I'm buying a piece of real estate and I'm gonna come into your neighborhood and do something. All of this, I and your, it has to be out the window. For me, it's, a, it's striking a balance and really listening. I mean, what is the, what is the approach for a, a, that renovation or that project and why? Why would a community want it? Um, there are often reasons to want change, um, but, but kind of trying to usher that and being mindful of um, how scary that can be and how marginalized some communities have been for years that when somebody comes knocking on the door and saying, you know, I want to change something again, you know, there, you, you got to understand the history of a neighborhood to understand where people are coming from. 
um, as to whether or not that that change is going to produce um, an, an effect that they'll be able to see and feel. Are they going to feel welcome in that new development or not? That's just a part. That's a part of what I do, but it, it's really um, I think so valuable to bear that in mind. And um, it's such a it's such an honor. <laughs> it's such it's so difficult and such an honor to think about that. I've sat at the table with other developers and I'll bring up a community context and I see eye rolls. And I think, you know, I, hey, I, you know, often my response is um, I can frame back to you why those eye rolls are out of, out of character. Because when you think about the development cost, literally to not um, taking into account somebody's neighborhood. I mean, I, hey, I'm a mom. And if something happens on my block, you don't have to pay me to come out <laughs> with a picket sign. I'll be there because it matters to me and my kids. You can't underestimate that um, that value. And and so I I just I love to be a part of the conversations around um, what what is innovation, what is development, what is community development, and how as a lawyer can I. Um, understand all of those positions and try to back the right, the right move. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I hope that I'm backing the right move um, on those deals, but. Yeah. And these are really big issues. So I can imagine also people who don't live in the neighborhoods or don't know what it's like firsthand um, to, you know, not have a home, for example, right. that they might be, they might think they're solution oriented, but they're not actually getting to the root of the problem and <laughs> before trying to impose a solution. So I think it's amazing. It sounds like you're someone who definitely brings people <laughs> back to where they need to be before moving forward, which is so important. Well, it, uh, it's, it's fun work to do that. And it really keeps me on my toes. I also mm -hmm. wanted something where um, it changes every day and, and, you know, I also practice um, nonprofit law, so that's kind of looking at, you know, what what where does where's the intersection between philanthropy and nonprofits and corporate um, uh, environmental and social governance goals, and and you know how can we all do do good work while doing well? Mm -hmm. What a revolutionary idea! <laughs> How do we get there? It's a challenge and it keeps me on my toes. It's really fun. Um, and then before I want to open it up to um, everyone here, if anyone would like to ask Alicia a question, you can unmute yourself or put it in the chat box. But before we do that, um, Alicia, is there anything that you hope people take away from this conversation and um, bring into their lives or, you know, think of themselves in this new way, like you mentioned, where you can be so many different community members all at once. Yeah. Or so many different hats. I mean, I wish I had known that the fields of economic development and community development existed when I was younger, because I could have, I think, done even more, right? <laughs> um, I, and, and within those fields, I mean, it's, I think of it almost like, like movie production. You think about movie production, we're here in LA, and we know a lot of, of entertainment folks. You know how there's, there's accountants within that. There's showrunners, there's writers. I mean, there's all these different skill sets mm -hmm. and the outcome is a movie. The same deal with affordable housing and um, how nonprofits and doing good work and community service that is really rooted or kind of um, centered around a changing landscape or real estate. I didn't know that there were so many seats at the table within those fields. I wonder how Marlboro students would, would take that, right? That you can be an accountant. I love the numbers. I never even knew until I was a much older adult, but I love numbers. But you know, you can you can look at spreadsheets and, and run formulas um, in this field as an accountant, where you could do um, graphic design and architecture in this field as an architect that really understands the rules and the code requirements around affordable housing. I mean, it's got all the things. And I don't think that, um, you know, as a country, we do enough justice to this really dynamic and unique field that can take any of your attributes or your skill sets and utilize them in a way that creates so much good. And so I think, 
you know, we often know about jobs in philanthropy and really supporting programs, but there's this whole real estate side um, that's a part of philanthropy, that's, that's a part of nonprofit development that is like so fascinating. And there's very few women involved in it. Mm -hmm. Very few women. I mean, you know, I, I have the, the honor of, of wearing the hard hat on site sometimes. Um, and some of the, some of the contractors have, have never been joined by a female project manager, a female director of real estate, a, a woman who's in the pro forma, in the numbers. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous mm -hmm. in 2022. And so I, I, I really see the need to tell more and more women about the dynamicism of that as a field. And it's, it's, um, it's the most exciting career I could have built for myself. That's amazing. Yeah. At the end of last year for International Women's Day and for Share the Wisdom, which is an event for juniors to meet with alumni and um, practice informational interviewing, mm -hmm. we did focus on all these different career paths and sometimes unconventional career paths for women. Yeah. And I think it did shed light on this idea, you know, a student who takes a coding class, but is really obsessed with the beauty industry. You know, we had a web security director here for Glossier, actually, she's an alum. Wonderful. And so students got to see all these different um, categories within different industries that they might yeah. be interested in, but they're, you're so used to hearing like CEO, director of operations, like these you know, titles that are, everyone knows. And I yeah. think it's really great to hear you talk about it in this way where, you know, there's so many um, people behind the scenes making all of it happen. Exactly. And really fun type. It, it changes every day. My job is never static and that keeps me on my toes and makes me feel really connected to my neighborhood, our city, the That's region, po politics, I mean, really fun stuff. Nice. Yeah. Um, okay, so Catherine um, sent a message and it says, hello, Alicia, it's so lovely to hear about your work with affordable housing and homelessness. This is an area in which I'm deeply interested in and have invested a lot of time and effort thinking about. While there is clearly a need for building more affordable units, one of the areas I understand is a serious problem is a lack of transparency in the coordinated entry system, the housing system for those experiencing homelessness, which takes somewhere between two to four years for those who are ready and have the means to afford housing to be able to actually have units identified for them. What work does NU do in this area? Yeah, so the CES system is run by LASA, the LA Homeless Services Authority. Um, and it's literally like a database and you have to um, enter, um, a, you know, an individual's information to gain access and um, wait for the system to pr produce, to populate for the units that are available. Two of the flaws there, well, well, first, what does new economics for women do? We participate in that database and we build up affordable housing to try to add more units into the system. But, but two of the flaws there, there's one of the regulations in the CES system is that you have to have documented instances of homelessness. So where we see ourselves kind of missing targets is we're not documenting the number of women living in cars or women living in domestic violence situations that are not documented instances of homelessness, but their housing instability such that you know, they're on the verge, they're on the verge of homelessness. And, and we're going to start seeing that wave as we come out of COVID. We're going to see more and more families that have been living with domestic violence perpetrators or have been living in their cars that haven't been counted in homeless counts and that are not in the CES system. So they're not going to have access to opportunity. And then the other obstacle um, for CES is when it, that's, that's just to deal, it, there's typical factors, there's gradations as to, as to whether you're chronically homeless, you know, multiple instances of homelessness over the past four years or how long you've been homeless. But we have a dearth, not only of units, but then of the mental health and the substance abuse programs that help somebody stay on track. Um, and so CES, I mean, lots of folks, are, are doing amazing work, um, but, but we, need, we need more skilled resources um, to be able to really make a dent in the crisis. And the units that are happening, you know, it's $700,000 now to build one, that's a unit is an apartment, one unit of housing. And the, the period of time that it takes 
from me identifying a parcel of land to getting it online, it's often five to six years. So we're not, you, you all know, we're, we're not creating to, um, to house those that are unhoused in a quick enough fashion um, so that we really see that change in our streets and in our communities. And I guess to follow up on that, I saw, you know, I think this happened during the pandemic, like the VA in Westwood, how they now utilize that whole lawn area. Yeah. Um, Tiny lawns. Yeah. And I saw one too, as I was exiting the freeway in Pasadena, there was an area like right on that on-ramp with a bunch of tiny homes now built. So, you know, how long does that take when you recognize a piece of land that isn't being used or might be public property? So maybe it's easier to kind of start the process. I have no idea. Um, like, is that happening more now? Or yeah, I it, it is. And those projects took years to, to develop that, right? And there's a lot of debate over where those are situated and who has to bear the brunt of people walking around um, their, their properties. Um, they're highly, highly contested. So sometimes what, what we have to do as affordable housing developers is try to get people to get out of the way, get on board or get out of the way, just, just kind of stand down. Um, because the NIMBY, not in my backyard aspect, can be so, so huge. And at the same time, I understand not wanting, I mean, I, we, I, I can't build an affordable housing complex for folks who are chronically homeless without recognizing that when you centralize chronic conditions in that way, what's the long-term plan? I mean, you got to have a, a, a staffing ratio that's pretty intense. And so you know, everything, everything needs a next step for mm -hmm. the tiny homes. I think those are, and there was a, just a, a bad fire, unfortunately at the VA a couple of weeks ago, but um, for the tiny homes, I, I, I don't know what the transition plan is out. And again, we're going to see that surge coming out of COVID of, of people, I think falling through the cracks, particularly when the rent moratorium is lifted. And I'm on calls with the apartment owners association and developers associations that are saying how unfair it is that apartment owners have had to bear the brunt of this, um, this the social need for housing and can't kick people out and can't, can't raise rents. Um, it sounds like such a, like a Lorax problem as though, <laughs> so apartment owners are, you know, the, the big, 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 bad uh, corporatists. And what we find in LA city is a lot of apartment owners are individuals where that apartment building they own, that's their retirement. I mean, that's, that's, it's, it's individuals, it's families that like all their eggs are in that basket. And when they can't make their mortgage payment, all of that collapses for them too. So, you know, interesting dynamics across the board. Absolutely. Um, Kai asked, Alicia, thank you for sharing your story with us this evening. What do you think about the recent affordable housing bill that Governor Newsom passed related to converting commercial sites for additional housing? Yeah, it, that sounds really exciting. But um, there's a lot of conversion going on. Jameson Properties is leading it in Koreatown. Jamie Jameson is the CEO, um, and she is spearheading the conversion of a lot of commercial properties into housing. Not necessarily affordable, but um, it's a start. And, and I think the market's just going to push that, that conversion because we don't need as much commercial office space. Um, here's, here's what I see as a practitioner. Everybody's got to get on board. When I'm literally planning to convert something or purpose something or build something, I need the fire department to weigh in. Um, city planning has to weigh in and, and go through code check. Department of Cultural Affairs has to weigh in and count the palm trees around, right? There are a number of departments, and I'm using LA as an example, um, that have to weigh in. And the timeline, it, it starts to tick when you put your application in, but then the circle back and double checking takes so long. And when I say that we have to get on board or get out of the way, I'm talking about a lot of our um, a lot of our mechanisms that we all have to recognize that we all play a role. As an example, the fire department plays a role. Can we expedite affordable housing applications, please? Mm -hmm. or, or not? 
So, the, the, I mean, these are the basic questions that I advocate for is how, what are all of our roles and how can we all get out of the way to recognize that this is our crisis of the moment and we can, we can meet it or we can continue to kick it down the road and recognize that people are, um, are, are, are really destitute. Our own neighbors are really destitute. Mm -hmm. What do we do? So Ellen asked, how do you find a select, find and select people to live in the housing units you develop? Does new do that? Or is that a separate group? And why is it so expensive to build new units? Hi, Ellen. Hi. I know um, uh, I, I, Lizzie is Thanks. a girlfriend. Lizzie was in your class, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. yes. Um, so how do we find people? You know, it's interesting. A lot of the affordable housing developers are now doing a lottery system. Because can you imagine when a, a build when a building comes online and buildings, when they have what are called tax credit deals, these are some of the bigger apartment buildings, might have like 80 apartments, might have 100, might have 120, that'd be a huge one, right? So you have thousands of applicants. Mm. And imagine, it's all of the mechanisms that we take for granted. These folks are not online. These are paper applications. And they all have to be submitted with social security and tax documents. And, you know, part, applying for an apartment is running credit. And so um, folks have to often get numbers in a lottery system. So, you know, a group like New Economics for Women will, will market pretty broadly. We uh, have now developed relationships um, with a lot of groups that serve women, domestic violence shelters or veterans groups serving women, vets. Um, you know, the marketing um, is helpful to try and get the word out, but there's also fair housing rules that make sure that you can't select, you know, somebody over somebody else based on um, a characteristic that would, that would discriminate. And so that's also, you know, very important balance that everybody has to take very seriously, especially because you're dealing with a public resource. A lot of these developments take public subsidy and you better be sure that all of those those things as a lawyer <laughs> constantly checking for those pieces because they're so important to the public trust mm -hmm. and, um yeah that often it's it nowadays it's often a lottery system and it often is um you know thousands of people applying for one unit of housing and for the ones <laughs> the ones that you're working on at new are they all women that take no no there's one there is one that is um it's 60 units of transitional housing so women who have had um instances of domestic violence or homelessness but otherwise um it's open to anybody okay marketing is done often to women um but applications are for everybody. um well, thank you so much, Alicia. Just to wrap it up, I'd love to hear what you do to kind of main, like find peace and decompress. I mean, you do such you a- You heard her. That was my <laughs> daughter. I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old son. And, um, you know, I just have so much fun to experience the world through them. Being a mom is a, it's a brand new hat for me. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's super fun. I don't, I don't know if, I have any time to myself anymore, <laughs> Natalie, but I'll take it. I'll take it. The trade-offs are worth it. Well, yeah. thank you so much. And thank you everyone to being here. Um, for everyone who missed it, I'm going to share the YouTube uh, link tomorrow. So you'll be able to share that around and um, it'll be on the Marlboro School YouTube channel permanently. So anyone can watch it. And um, yeah, thank you so much, Alicia. This was wonderful. I'm so honored, Natalie. Honestly, it's like the thrill of my career. Uh, you know, I, I dreamed of Caswell Hall one day, you know, at graduation, being invited back. And this is my Caswell Hall moment. Aww. And I'm really appreciative to you guys to have me tonight. It's my sincere pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Please come to campus anytime and see the movie <laughs> as well. I'd love to. <laughs> well, thank you. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you for joining. Thank you.